So welcome everyone, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and start as people keep joining us today. Um, thank you very much for joining the NCTMA webinar in our summer series. Um, and today we have a special one. We are going to talk about video interviewing tips for treasury professionals. And um, today I have here Joe Grabowski here with me. Hi, Joe. Hey, good morning, Tanya, how are you? Good, good, thank you, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Great, um, and Joe is the Vice President of Treasury Talent at Treasury Specific Recruitment Firm, uh, and he oversees their US operations while focusing on recruitment in the Eastern region of the United States. He has been in the recruitment space for 14 years. He has experience in corporate and third-party recruiting across various industries, information technology, healthcare, and treasury. Um, and so I think what's unique about today's session is that we have here um, a treasury specific recruiter and Joe is very experienced in recruiting in general, but also their firm specializes in treasury. And that that's, I think is, um, is, is um, unique about this conversation. So we can all um, have all our questions answered, <laughs> I think. So today we would like to have this interactive session and we encourage you all to ask questions don't shy away from this right now i have all the participants on mute but there is this functionality of raising a hand you should see it at the bottom also there's a q a box if you would like to just quickly type in something as we go you're welcome to do so or if you raise your hand we can unmute you so that you can you can talk and i think uh, i think joe as we go also like we have a couple of slides, but it's basically more of a conversation here today. And uh, yeah. yeah, so like I said, get the questions answered and just have this, um, we hope to have this interactive discussion. So um, I, I also could like um, allow some time after every point we make, like after every slide, allow some time for everyone to, to speak out. So I also can, uh, you know, um, do like, we can do this smaller Q and A um, at like, at the end of every like point women yeah. uh, before before we start i just i just want to make a quick announcement for everyone who was um on the previous webinars and already received some email communication and knows about the treasury coalition i just wanted to remind everyone that the nctma is now a part of the treasury coalition uh, the initiative launched by the strategic treasurer and that includes um many partners um, among treasury uh, professionals, treasury companies, the and advisors, and um, this week it, it is um, a new a new survey is launched uh, this week for the next two weeks, as they do this on the bi biweekly basis. So we are going to uh, post um, a link to register on our website to receive this communication. We don't want to spam everyone um, who may maybe not interested, but it's, it's really insightful. So uh, the survey, the link to the survey is gonna be posted on our LinkedIn group. And uh, you're welcome to register on our web website to receive the communication about this more frequently. And our next webinar next Tuesday, June 16th is going to close this summer series for now. We'll do more later, don't worry about that. Uh, and uh, so in the next webinar is going to, um, we're going to have some reports and results on this um, Treasury Coalition survey. It's going to be called the Global um, Recovery Monitor results. And we're going to have some really great speakers who, who, who are going to discuss the results of the survey so far. So stay tuned for that. So now I think we can go ahead and start. So Joe, if you'd like to open this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Tanya, for the introduction. Thanks everyone for showing up this morning. Um, you know, as, as Tanya had, uh, as we had talked a little bit more about this and talked about just how the industry is evolving and how companies are evolving as we start to pull out of this pandemic, um, this is an important topic that we felt together, I think um, should be addressed within the industry just because now that companies are starting to resume hiring, although a little bit slow, um, video interviewing is a, a different animal all in itself. So what we're gonna take you through today is just um, some basic tips and, trip, or tips and tricks that uh, 
that I have from my 14 years of experience in the industry, um, eight months or so being in treasury. So that's been drinking from a fire hose, but that's been a lot of fun. Um, so with that, I'll take you over to the agenda. Of course, computer, there we are. All right, so what I wanna to cover today, um, my goals uh, for today, you know, I think it's important to go through those just because I, wanna, I want you to understand the journey that I wanna take you on and it's important to, uh, to vocalize that so that I'm keeping myself on track at the same time. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about why this matters, both from an interviewer and an interviewee perspective. Uh, and then we'll actually get into the interview tips for both sides. All right, so what do we wanna do today? What do we wanna cover? Um, as Tanya had mentioned, please make this conversational and interactive. Um, it's a donation of my time and effort to give back to the Treasury community. As Tanya mentioned, uh, I've been recruiting for 14 years. This is what I've done as a career. This is, uh, and I'm speaking with both hiring managers and job seekers each and every day in the Treasury space. And these are the conversations that I'm having on a regular basis. Uh, these are tips and tricks that I discuss on a regular basis. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's important to put your best foot forward as you're interviewing, no matter whether it's in person, virtual, whatever it may be. So as we're going through this, please feel free to ask questions. Um, don't just have me talk at you for an hour. I, I promise it's, uh, it'll be a lot more enjoyable if, if it's more of a ping pong and conversation more so than me just talking at you. So share your experiences, whether they're positive or negative, you know, there might be the nothing's perfect as we go along. And um, I certainly have war stories from my experience and I have a lot of success stories as well. And I always love to hear other people's experiences and stories uh, too. So. And, and something I also wanted to bring up, uh, uh, like we don't have to discuss this from the job seeker perspective, right? So it's, it's, it's actually around interviewing process in general. And yeah. I noticed that a lot of times uh, higher position managers who have like hiring managers in organizations yeah. they don't necessarily always get this training on uh, interviewing process right so yeah. hr of course has this experience on a daily basis and they they get this training uh, sometimes um this training is available throughout the organization which is a good thing but not all yeah. always and not all the questions maybe get answered so this is also a good opportunity just to to talk through this from the interviewer perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you bring up a good point there. I think it is probably an underserved market. I know I've done a lot of coaching with hiring managers just about how to put your best foot forward. And again, I'm gonna drive home a couple of points as to why that's important too. Um, and of course, as an interviewee, I, I think we all have experience with that, you know, as it, it's kind of the, the table stakes to start your career and to move forward. So uh, we'll definitely cover both sides and, and the importance of both sides. Um, and then, you know, last but not least, if I give you a whole bunch of complicated tips and tricks that just seem insurmountable or impossible to implement, you're not going to use them. So my goal for this is just to provide you with some simple, some simple ideas that you can incorporate into your own processes or into your own interviews um, that you can apply right away. It, it's not uh, reinventing the wheel. It's not rocket science, anything like that. Um, again, the, the beauty is in the simplicity. So. Uh, that's what we're going to cover in the goals today. So why exactly does this matter? We're going to go through this for a little bit. Now, you see the bullet points that I have up on the, the slide right now. Um, but let's just take a step back before we even get into that. Getting to the interview stage isn't easy. You know, it's uh, in, in, in order to drive that point home, I'm going to reverse engineer this hiring funnel a little bit for you. So... As a job seeker, you know, Tanya, whether it's you, whether it's me, if you're actively looking for a position, you're spending on average an hour of 11, or I'm sorry, 11 hours of your week, just actively looking for jobs and applying to jobs. That doesn't even include the time networking or spent interviewing, anything like that. This is just simply trying to uncover opportunities. So the trick to that is it's not only you spending this time, you have competition out there. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, and this is pulled from Glassdoor, May not necessarily, you know, the number may be a little bit lower in the treasury space, but you'd be surprised. Like I said, I've been on the corporate side where you're looking at some of these applications and you just have people who are just sending a hope and a prayer, hoping that they get a, a conversation, um, even though they're not qualified for the role. So the average corporate job advertisement gets about 250 resumes. Um, so that's why I always advise people, even to get to that point, you want to make sure that you're really paying attention to the company. You want to make sure that 
you're trying to identify trends in resume or I'm sorry, in job descriptions in terms of what they're looking for, the experience, any kind of technical skills, anything like that. And don't embellish the experience on your resume, but absolutely make sure that it is present um, and that it pulls through because there's a good chance on the other side, you're gonna have a recruiter such as myself, uh, you're gonna have an HR professional who maybe doesn't do a whole lot of uh, hiring in the treasury space, they may not necessarily understand the skill sets or industry terms or anything like that. It could be something as simple as them doing a control F and looking for specific terms on the resume. So you want to make sure that, uh, that to even get yourself in the game that you're at least formatting your resume and submitting that resume accordingly. Um, and another quick tip there, um, don't put a date on the resume. So don't put like Joe Grabowski 6-4-2020 because all of a sudden, if I'm using that and I forget to change the format and it's November, it's gonna look a little goofy and it's gonna be just a, a dead giveaway that this person didn't pay a whole lot of attention before applying. So we've covered how many people typically apply. We've covered how long that you usually spend on your job search. Here's the thing, on average, there are only five interviews that take place. Um, five people are selected for interviews. So you have a one in 50 shot essentially, if you're, again, working your way down the funnel, you have a one in 50 shot of securing that interview. And that's why it's that much more important from a job seeker perspective that you're putting your best foot forward if you do get the opportunity to interview. Because at the end of the day, in most cases, out of those 250 people that started or 250 plus, only one person's gonna get hired. In some, in some cases I've seen um, a hiring manager be so blown away that they create another position or it creates a pipeline for maybe later on down the line um, but the reality is we're all competing for one spot. So that's the whole idea is just to make sure that I'm giving you the advice to put your best foot forward. Um, so that as you're competing against the other people in the treasury space, that uh, you're increasing your odds to, to really secure that position. So um, now I'm gonna get over to the bullet points that you'll actually see on the slide. So the interview format's actually changing. Um, you know, heading into the pandemic, there was a, a trend that video interviews are starting to become more present. Um, they've been present in the IT space for a very long time, not so much in healthcare, but in IT, it's been remote interviewing, video interviewing has been very much present. And um, even heading into, I was reading a Forbes article uh, that was published in early May, but heading into March, about 89% of employers said that they were gonna incorporate some sort of video interviewing into their evaluation process. And, I can only imagine that as this pandemic has hit, that percentage has only gone higher. Um, and that's where it becomes that much more important for someone in the treasury space, because although the ideas, the strategies, um, in some cases, the technology, the TMS is cutting edge, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of automation, you're seeing a lot of AI. Um, the mindset traditionally, right, wrong, or indifferent, has been a little bit more outdated. Um, you know, everything's still face to face, it's still, uh, a very personal relationship and there is another barrier to entry I guess when you get into um, uh, in per, or I'm sorry and when you get into technical interviews or, or virtual interviews instead of the face-to-face -face interviews so um, there's the stat around there now for interviewers I've already covered the important piece for interviewees interviewers guess what North Carolina is a pretty busy market in the Treasury space um, you know, we track analytics, uh, we track job postings basically across 47 different markets. And I, when I was looking through North Carolina's, I think you'll be surprised to find that from January 1st of this year through May 31st of this year, North Carolina's had about 75 total jobs advertised just in the treasury space. And how that breaks down, um, you know, you're going to have basically your, your treasury analysts, there were about 36 opportunities that have been advertised. You have about six treasury manager openings. Uh, three treasury directors, one AT, three treasurers, um, 11 what I'll call systems implementation or more technology focused roles, uh, seven just flat out consulting or consultant roles, and then three treasury accountant roles, and then um, eight additional roles that they usually fall within financial services and how I'll qualify that has been FinTech, um, insurance, anything that doesn't fit that traditional mold of the, the corporate hierarchy or the standard corporate hierarchy of treasurer, AT, director, manager, analyst, or accountant. So um, 
there is competition from an employer standpoint. And with this being such a niche skill set, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward when you have the opportunity to speak with people in the external market as well. Um, just to give you some additional stats around that, if you don't provide a positive experience in your hiring and your interview process, uh, I was looking at some surveys, about 83% of people surveyed said that a negative experience will not only change their mind about the company that they liked or they had an interest in, but 42% won't even apply to your company again or won't engage in any kind of passive outreach um, if they had a bad experience with your process. In addition to that, 22% are actually, they're not gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna go to their networks and they're gonna tell people not to apply or, or not to apply or to engage with your postings or with your company. So now you have someone who's actively working against you. And then 9% um, overall will just completely encourage others to boycott your brand completely. So if you're in a business, uh, a B2C or a business to consumer business, and you're providing bad experiences, it's not gonna work well, not only for your own brand when you go to hire, but it's actually impacting your ability to attract people to your product or to get people to use your product in the market. Um, I think that's where a lot of people or a lot of employers that I speak with, they kind of have um, a little bit of an arrogance, just like, hey, we're the company, people wanna come work for us, this can work against you if you're not if you're not doing right by people on the back end. I want to make sure that uh, that I talk about that because again, uh, we talked about this at the beginning of the presentation. It is a two-way street. Interviewing is always going to be a two-way street. And um, you know, I know with the pandemic, obviously hiring has slowed down. There are more people on the market, that type of stuff. But it is going to pick back up. Treasury is still a niche skill set, and if anything, it's going to get more competitive as we pay out or as we uh, as we pull out of this. Yeah, while you're on this, Joe, uh, I was just thinking, and you were uh, giving some great uh, insight, I think, with the statistics. Uh, first of all, the average numbers. Well, I, I, I am a believer in uh, that statistics actually shows you a lot and, and uh, like drives the informed decisions. So also for the personal matters, it's, it's also important to, to, to be aware. So, uh, and so yeah, average statistics, I think it, it, it's, um, it's a good thing to know that treasury specific statistics is even more insightful but uh, in you in general in your um experience because you have extensive experience in recruiting mm -hmm. and you were not in hiring treasury professionals only specifically yeah. before as you do right now so do you find anything like dramatically different in hiring treasury professionals i mean maybe, maybe not maybe there is something yeah. just just curious to know uh, like what do you feel is the differentiator yeah, you know, it's, um, that's an interesting question because uh, I think each industry has its own challenges within hiring. And uh, as I mentioned, most of my experience comes in the IT space, which is very similar to treasury in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways, just because it does tend to be more of a niche skill set. There's barriers to entry or barriers of entry to get into the profession to begin with. Um, and uh, let's be honest, it's a competitive hiring space. So um, you know, what I've found, I guess the main difference there and what I've really enjoyed about the treasury space has been a lot of the people that I'm speaking with and what I love about treasury, I've learned more about it is that you have to be business facing. You have to be a strategic partner to the business and those soft skills are that much more important. It's not just the technical aspect that comes into this. Um, and we'll get into the soft skills as we get into the interview tips, but that's been one of the things that I've really noticed and, and really started to enjoy about the treasury space is just the relationships that I'm forming with people. It's, you know, um, I hate to generalize, but treasury professionals in general are just, they're easier to speak with. Um, they're open to conversations. There's a lot more strategy involved. So people are open to having networking conversations and uh, just more friendly and, and more, I, I think what's been really unique for us has been uh, that it is an undershared space. You know, generally you're going to have accounting or finance recruiters who maybe recruit on one to two treasury positions a year. If that, if it's just a client who's coming across saying, Hey, I have something, of course, they're going to take it on and say, yeah, that's great. Um, and then they're talking to the external market and the external market, the resounding feedback that we get is that they don't know your skill set. They don't know like Tanya, if you're talking to me about cash flow analysis and, and uh, cash flow forecasting, they're not making that connection that that could be related to the management piece. It could be related to capital markets in some cases. I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, it, it's just very fascinating to me. Um, the more that I've learned about the industry, the more that I love it, I'll be perfectly honest. And that's why I just love interacting with people in the treasury space is because I get to learn basically what I tell everyone is that um, treasury is essentially the people who are pulling the levers and pushing the buttons behind the curtain that I didn't even realize existed for corporate strategy. And that's why it's just, it's so fascinating to have those conversations and to learn more about people and their decision-making and also the businesses each and every day. I agree. Cool. Any other questions? Um, yeah, everyone, if, if there are any questions, just raise your hand and, um, and ask. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll just keep going right on along. You know, if, uh, if anyone does ask any questions, please feel free to interrupt. I know I can be long winded and everything I do. That's why I have these slides is to keep me on target. And I also have my notes here too. So, <laughs> um, you know, so getting into the next bullet point, not only is the interview format changing for some people, if you're not technically savvy, that can work against you. You know, if you're a relationship person, if you're used to the face to face, you're just telephone conversations opposed to having to speak to someone over um, over a computer looking at a screen, you know, it, it's, it can work against you if you're not comfortable with it. So you can find yourself at a disadvantage. As we mentioned, it's already pretty competitive from a job seeker standpoint, just given everyone who's applying and everyone um, or the other four people against you for the sake of examples, uh, the other four people against you who are interviewing, you want to make sure you're putting your best foot forward. And if you're not comfortable with the technology or you're, uh, you find that that's a hindrance for you, you're not going to, I mean, your, your chances, I don't have stats behind it, but your chances of landing that job are going to be drastically reduced. So it's that much more important to take this seriously, practice, get comfortable, use the technology, have as many of these conversations as you can, and just get comfortable with it. Because this is the way, at least from what I'm seeing in the industry, this is the way that the interview process is evolving. Um, so you want to make sure, again, that you're putting your best foot forward and doing whatever you can to make sure that you're giving yourself the best chance at getting the job. And I do have it, you know, the last bullet point, video interviews are different. I, you know, I think I'm just stating the obvious there, but there are actually two different types of video interviews. So traditionally, you know, you're going to have an in-person or you're just going to have a flat out recorded interview. And what I'll get into first is your in-person interview. Um, that's usually going to be conducted on a platform like this. Could be a Zoom, could be Skype, um, could be FaceTime in some cases. Uh, there's another platform called Blue Jeans, which no idea why it's called Blue Jeans, but it just is. Uh, it, it leads to a lot of confusion when people ask me about it. Uh, there's also Microsoft Teams or just another conferencing technology. So in this situation, you are going to have a live interviewer or you're going to have a panel on the other side. A little bit more preferred on my side, just because I... I enjoy being able to, it creates a more natural flow for conversation. Um, I think I do better with them just because I'm able to see people's reactions. I'm able to, to actually hear uh, how my message is landing and uh, I'm able to adjust accordingly and it, and it allows for questions. It's a back and forth. It's a ping pong. It's a conversation. Now, um, and it allows you to get to know the hiring manager because when you get to the recorded interview that I had talked about, Usually you're going to find that in a pre-employment screening or maybe during the application process. And it's going to be, you know, some of these platforms are going to be HireVue, Spark Hire, VidCruiter, um, something similar to that. You may not even notice it as a job seeker just because normally it's going to be company branded. So you wouldn't even know the technology that's behind it. But what it is, is it's, at least to me, it's incredibly awkward. You're either, it's a pre-recorded person asking you a question. Um, maybe it's just these written questions where you're, you're just reading it and then you're answering a question and you don't know how it's landing. Um, you know, it's very, very awkward, at least to me, because uh, it doesn't allow for you to ask questions. It doesn't allow for you to expound or to expand upon answers. Um, it's very transactional, and I highly recommend that clients don't pursue that route, but I know it definitely exists, and it can trip you up, trip you up if you're not prepared. Um, I think at this point, we could do a polling question. I, I have just, just a, um, a quick one for, okay. for all of us to understand where, uh, where we stand, uh, where all the participants stand with interview, like having this experience of video interviews. Um, so I have, I put up a question just now you should be able to see it yeah. um, it 
it asks, have you been on a virtual interview before? And there are three um, answers. Yes, mostly as an interviewer. Yes, mostly as an interviewee. No, I have not. So if you just go ahead and, and um, click your um, answer, we'll just get this feeling of where we all stand. Um, I think we, we have the answers. So um, it pretty much, no, I have not, is 75% of our audience today. Yeah. So you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so listen in and, uh, and ask your questions. And I have 17% yes, mostly as an interviewer and 8% yes, mostly as an interviewee. So if you, if you still, um, if you want to contribute something on, on your end and say like, hey, I, I've done such and such and that worked great or, or, or the opposite, um, you're also welcome to do so. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. And, and again, this is, um, this is just a trend that we're seeing in the industry. If you haven't experienced it yet, you might. And the whole idea behind this is just to prepare you so that if you do run into it, you're not being tripped up over something simple. I don't want to make it seem like uh, like winter's coming for my Game of Thrones fans. Like it's just off in the distance and this is the future. This is going to happen. You need to be afraid of it. It's not that. It's just simply prepare yourself because you never know what uh, what the company's interview process is going to look like. And you might cost yourself an opportunity that you really want. I'm actually not surprised by, by so many people answering, no, I have not uh, had this experience in the past because I don't think I have till recently, actually. Um, I, and, and I had a few conversations with hiring uh, uh, managers who were just mentioning this to me that they started to do more uh, video interviews. And uh, one person said, hey, I've never done this before. And it's new and I kind of like it because it's very, you don't have to, um, you, you can just schedule it faster. You don't have to, you know, um, to, to allow for, for everyone to travel to a specific office and all that. So it's easier. Uh, someone else told me, hey, we, we were doing this all the time. Uh, that was uh, one of the big four um, companies. And they said that they've been recording graduates um, for, for a long time, um, it, yeah. like just virtually from, from different uh, schools. So yeah, uh, it, it, it varies, uh, but I, I'm not surprised that people usually don't um, get hired through video interviews in Treasury because like DJ mentioned before, it's, it's mo more of a face-to-face um, -face kind of uh, yeah. process. It, it just always used to be, <laughs> but yeah. I, don't, I think not anymore, right? Do you see more uh, video, like hiring only with video interviews now or, or not yeah. yet? You didn't. Yeah, it's, uh, we're starting to see it pick up in some cases, um, and it really just comes down to the manager's comfort, you know. It's and that ties back into the mindset that we were talking about earlier. One of the one of the learning points for me, I guess, or one of the things I had to get used to is, um, in some companies, it's still that corporate environment still exists where if the work isn't getting done right in front of me, it's not happening, and that's where I think this pandemic kind of forced a lot of people's hands. Um, but not only is it just managing your team day to day, it's more of a, how do I get used to interviewing? Because it is, it is different. It is a little bit awkward. And if you're not comfortable with it, if you, because in reality, Tanya, I'm talking to you and I'm talking to the group right now, but in the bottom right hand corner right here, I can see myself talking too, which is very, very strange. And that took a long time for me to get used to. And if I'm just coming into this my first time, not used to seeing movement on my screen as I'm talking, I can freak myself out. I mean, it is. <laughs> so, but yes, a, a very long answer to a short question is, yeah, we are starting to see clients um, just going, you know, they're either going one or two routes. It's, hey, instead of doing telephone conversations or just given the circumstances, um, we'll do everything but an offer because I actually want to meet the person face to face or it'll be more of a, you know what, this is just a sign of the times. We need to hire this person regardless. So we're just going to have to trust on video interviewing um, and telephone conversations. So, but it is, it is certainly, and it's topical for this. That's why uh, this conversation is topical is because it is a trend that we are seeing in the industry and it is starting to pick up. So, cool. Uh, do we have any other questions or are we good to go? No questions just yet. So uh, just a quick disclaimer here. A lot of the tips that we're discussing today are going to be more for that live person-to-person, face-to-face, well, virtual face-to-face -face interview. 
um, just because it is a little bit of a, a different ball game for the pre-recorded interviews. I mentioned that earlier, but uh, some of the tips are applicable, but my, my, my main area of focus is going to be that um, the face-to-face. -face. So with that, we'll jump into the tips. Now you're going to see some tips on the slide, and then I'm also going to talk to you about just a, a few additional, it might be like table stakes when it comes to uh, interviewing, but it's easy to forget because again, video interviewing, if you're not careful or if you're not comfortable with it, it can be intimidating. So it's important to prepare, uh, prepare for a virtual interview the same exact way that you would for a face-to-face -face interview. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, number one, your resume or your LinkedIn profile. Have that resume that you submitted, have that right in front of you so that you have a guide or have your LinkedIn profile pulled up um, I can't tell you the number of people that have sent me resumes I'm on an on uh, interview with them, and then um, they don't have that same version of their resume in front of them that I do in front of me. And then all of a sudden it comes out, well, oh, I don't remember what version you might have. And it's just like, oh, this isn't, this isn't a very good sign. Um, it usually leads to a pretty rocky road the rest of the way. I'm not a judgmental guy in that way, but I know a hiring manager at the same time Time is valuable, and if you have someone who you don't feel is fully committed to the process, it's usually not going to go too well. So, um, but along those same lines, interviewers, make sure that you have a copy of the person's resume or LinkedIn profile in front of you so that you have something to guide you along the way and that it's not just you coming in blind and make sure that you look at it before you actually have the conversation. <laughs> um, the last thing you want to be do, or the last thing you want to do is be caught learning about someone's experience as you're reading about it number one it makes it awkward because now you're on camera they can see you just sitting here going oh tell me about this it doesn't work too well um and again you're on the same stage that the interviewee is in in several capacities so make sure that you're being aware of that and that you're prepared um the job description and the roles and the responsibilities if you're an interviewee make sure that you are ready to speak about your relevant experience. Do a little bit of like work up front to try to anticipate the questions that they may ask you based on that job description. Like what have you done with capital markets? What have you done with FX? What have you done with cash management? Um, don't come into this and basically just hope for the best. Uh, you know, you can tell when someone's unprepared by it and you go to ask them the question they're like, oh no. Uh, well, and then it's just a choppy answer. And again, if, if you're not doing the prep up front, it's only going to harm you and harm your chances at actually trying to secure the position. So just make sure that you're doing that prep. From an interviewer perspective, please ensure that you're prepared to speak about the job and the value that it brings not only to you, but to the organization. Um, what I would call this is your selling points or your employee value proposition. Um, at the same time, I laid out why it's or how competitive this is. You want to make sure that, especially if you have an interest in the person, sell them on the role. Uh, you want them to come work for you. You want both, uh, the aim on both sides is even if it's not the right position for either one of you, or if it's not the right person, not the right position, your reputation is what matters and that's what you can control. So just make sure that you're prepared, that you're prepared to sell the organization, you're prepared to sell the role, um, because ultimately if that person walks out of that that interview and they don't think that's the right role for them but you're thinking yep this is my person i can cut off my interview process you're starting from square one so um just make sure that you have it not only you but the people that you're including in your interview process each and every person should have a consistent message around you're going to have your own little variances around why it's valuable to different people um, but in terms of selling point in the role make sure that you're not putting someone out there who's who's not a good salesperson i hate to say Hiring is sales at some point, but it is. You have to put your best foot forward. There has to be communication around value and there has to be a relationship formed. You have very few instances to do that. So you wanna make sure that you're just, you're, you're doing whatever you can to make sure that this deal works at the end of the day. And someone else who may not even have, that's why I wanna be careful about who you're including in your interview process or your panel, um, because someone who, maybe isn't even involved or this this position may not have a direct impact on them if they leave that person with a bad experience all of a sudden that it, it's factoring into the job seekers decision making so just be very very careful be prepared do your due diligence on that point tanya you mentioned earlier there's no or there are very few companies that will actually go through interview coaching interview training 
Um, but these are just simple wins and, and basic preparation that you can do to ensure that you're not creating a bad experience for someone. So um, not only on top of that, so we, we've, we've covered the basics just around what you should be doing, how you should be doing it. Bring energy. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're on the interviewer or interviewee side. The last thing that you want to hear if you're on the other side is, yeah, no, this sounds like a good position. No, uh, yeah, I can do that job. It, people aren't attracted to that. You know, it's, uh, again, we talked about the soft skills, uh, especially with Treasury being so business facing, so client facing. You have to be personable. You have to bring the energy more often than not, especially as you advance in your career, you start to hit that manager level and all of a sudden executive presence becomes important. So not only do you have to have the technical aptitude, but you have to be able to deal with or not deal with, you have to be able to communicate with people from different backgrounds and, and um, just be able to convey messages. And by the time you hit manager level, sometimes you're managing people on top of your on top of your day-to-day -day responsibilities and on top of managing the re uh, relationships with stakeholders in the business. This is all stuff that people pay attention to while they're evaluating people um, for their job, for their role, for their opportunity. So make sure that you're bringing the energy and you're bringing the excitement, especially if you're excited about the job. Just let them know. I'm not saying go off and start screaming and, and you know, just hooting and hollering and all that type of stuff, but make sure that you're bringing an energy to the conversation that, that will resonate with the other person because it does make a difference. Um, in addition to that, take notes and ask questions. Uh, you know, if, and this is gonna go for both interviewers and interviewees. I'd recommend a pen and pencil or uh, pen, pencil and paper uh, to take notes during that time. I'm guilty of this while I'm on the phone. I take notes on my computer and I type like a caveman so I can hear the quick clack and I know that the other people can. I always call that out. Um, but when I'm sitting face to face with someone, it's pretty strange if I have my monitor over here and you're looking at me and I'm going like this. It's, it just makes it different. It just, uh, it's real easy just to write notes on a piece of paper more so than try to type on a computer. Um, and it's a little bit more respectful to people's time. Same thing if you're on the interviewee side, you know, make sure that you're taking notes so that you have questions to ask later on, because the last thing that you want to do is the interviewer comes back to you and says, well, what questions do you have for me? And all of a sudden it's, I got nothing. I, yeah, I think you covered everything there. Thanks. And then how do you, I mean, what, what type of impression are you leaving on that person if that's what happens? <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting that you're saying this. It's, uh, it's actually a psychology trick, right? Uh, which uh, hiring process is a lot of this. <laughs> and uh, the, obviously because it's interaction between, between people actually. So, uh, and there is gonna be this like, subjective piece um, always there. Um, and, but yeah, it's interesting how you're mentioning that on like when you are on a video um, like call, you aren't, you are not, you kind of just, you have like the two dimensional pers perspective kind of thing, right? Yeah. So w if you turn somewhere, it's, it's very visible, <laughs> more yeah. visible than when you are in, in the same room with a person, right? Yeah. So it, it, I guess it is important um, how, how you position yourself in front of the camera. And if you're taking notes, uh, maybe even like looking down and writing down is more um, relatable <laughs> yeah. than just like turn, turning, to the side and typing something like you're distracted or something. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. And you know, the other part to that is, and I was going to cover this a little bit later on, but it kind of led into this is close email programs, close your messenger, close your LinkedIn, put your phone on vibrate, put it on silent, uh, close your outlook, do all of that. Because that's the other thing, Tanya, if I'm talking to you and all of a sudden I'm hearing beeping and then you're typing, you could be taking notes on our conversation, but I'm like, man, she's not even paying attention to what I'm saying. Right. So, and again, it just leaves a bad impression. So just, these are simple things that aren't necessarily present in all on-site meetings, but it's something that you need to be aware of as you go to enter video interviews. So, um, and then, so I'll start to get into the, the bullet points a little bit more. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty easy win for everyone. Check your internet connection. Um, you know, the, the potential challenge this causes is freezing, lagging, not being able to connect. Um, it can lead to frustration by both sides or on both sides by 
choppy conversation. Um, it could be a situation where, uh, you know, Tanya asks a question, I'm not receiving the question. By the time I go to answer, she's already asking her next question or asking if I heard, and it leads to just an awkward exchange there. Um, or you might not be able to connect the, the technology or the platform at all. So my recommendation is there, run an internet speed test. There are plenty of options if you just Google internet speed test. Um, you know, check the connection to the application or the platform that's being used for the interview. Um, Zoom, I know, has a separate room just to be able to do that to ensure that you can handle the, the video streaming. I believe that most platforms do. Uh, or ask the recruiter or the person scheduling the interview if they'd mind signing in five to ten minutes early just to ensure that everything is up to date so that you're not running into... The last thing you want to be doing, you're already uncomfortable having this conversation. You don't want to be panicked because all of a sudden you can't connect to the technology or you can't, um, you're unable to attend the interview and all of a sudden it's scrambling on both sides. That just kind of throws everyone out of whack and it's, it's unnecessary. So just make sure that you're prepping up front. Um, you know, stick to your allotted time. It's important when you're having phone conversations, when you're doing um, in-person interviews or when you're attending in-person interviews, it's even more important, I'd say on video interviews and this is on both sides. So with in-person interviews, it's usually acceptable to show up 15, 10, 15 minutes early. That way you can compose yourself. You can uh, prepare for the interview. You never know what signing in or security is going to look like, whatever it may be. Uh, you can settle down before you have that conversation. If you run into a situation where you're signing in 20, 30 minutes early, you could be interrupting someone else's interview. You could be interrupting an internal meeting and all of a sudden you're that person who's just like, I, sorry, I'll come back. You don't want to do that. So um, my recommendation is there for both interviewers and interviewees, stick to the allotted start and uh, stop times. So don't be afraid to call out, no matter which side of the desk you're on, hey, you know, we're coming up on time. Um, do we have a hard stop? Do we have a few more minutes? I do that while I'm on the phone. It's actually a sales trick. It's just showing respect for the other person's time and you kind of get a feel for the level of engagement if that conversation is going to extend beyond. Um, and But don't read too far into that. I'm going to say that with the caveat that if someone does have a hard stop, it's because they have a hard stop. It may not necessarily be because they're not enjoying the conversation. So um, it's always good just to, to stick to those times and make sure that you're checking with the other person and make sure that they still have the time to uh, to participate in the conversation. Now, specific to interviewees, check with the recruiter, check with the person who's scheduling the interview to understand the expectation around when it's appropriate to um, join and what that schedule may look like afterward if there is a hard stop. And uh, a quick win for an interviewer, if you're using the same technology and platform for your internal meetings, or your other interviews that you are for the interview that you're attending, give yourself a buffer. Make it a half hour. Um, I know with my conversations throughout the day, I absolutely do that. I plan for a half hour. I know I can talk and sometimes I run into someone on the other end of the, the phone who can talk as well. These conversations can take 45, 50 minutes just for an introductory conversation. Um, it's not that you know, we're being inefficient with time. It's just, there's a lot to talk about. So give yourself that buffer to avoid an awkward conversation and try to do the same thing on both sides of the desk. You know, so again, stick to the times, but give yourself a little bit of a buffer if, if at all possible, because it will just eliminate an awkward situation later on down the line. Um, this is the next one, be aware of your surroundings. This is accurate for both. Um, strangely enough, Quick conversation, uh, I guess, quick aside, when I was interviewing for a very large, or I'm sorry, I was working with a hiring manager at a very large uh, technology corporation. The person jumped on a video interview while they were in the bathtub. And it is one of the strangest things, like you can see this person splashing around and you can like cut his video off and then all of a sudden you can still hear it. And it's just like, you know what, why don't we just reschedule this? And I was just a, a recruiter, a third party sitting in on the interview and I, I just kind of had to pull the call the audible real quick and say, you know what, this probably isn't the time, we'll, we'll reschedule this, it's okay. Um, but it's a major difference between the in-person and the virtual interviews. It's easy to take a more relaxed approach if you're talking to someone from your living room, from your bedroom, from an office, whatever it may be, um, opposed to actually being in a conference room with that person or being in an office with that person. So just be mindful of the fact that this person's getting a small window into your world so try to avoid any kind of awkward situations by um, putting some contra or and basically inserting chaos into the process. So my recommendation is try to find a location where 
Uh, you're not going to be disturbed. Um, I know it may not necessarily be easy with the kids home all the time. And I have four dogs. They bark from time to time. I, if, if there's a risk of that and you can't find some, somewhere completely silent, at least call it out. Um, sometimes it leads to an icebreaker conversation. I can't tell you the amount of times that, you know, my dogs have started talking during a conversation or I'm talking, barking during a conversation. And all of a sudden someone's like, Oh, I have dogs. What kind of dogs do you have? And it just, it completely changes the tone of the conversation. You can work it in your favor, but you want to try to avoid it because again, you don't want to be distracted if you're trying to put your best foot forward and sell your, your experience and you as the right person for the job. And likewise, if you're trying to sell the job to the person that you know, you want to hire. So um, again, we talked about it. Close your email programs, make sure that there are no distractions just from the, the technology perspective. Put your phone on mute. Um, basics, but easy to forget if you're not careful or if you're running, if you're running into the meeting at the last minute. So just uh, something to be mindful of there. For video interviews, make sure you're in a, a neutral, um, a neutral location if you can, with very few or no distractions. Um, you know, I've, I've seen people with dirty laundry. I've seen drug paraphernalia. I've seen people with bongs on the, <laughs> the shelf and it's like, well, what do you have going on there? Uh, all of a sudden that kind of changes the tone of the conversation too. So you just want to make sure that you're, you're being, you're aware of it. No offensive pictures, posters, anything like that. Um, if you can avoid having family members or animals walk around the background, that would be ideal too. Um, doesn't have to be a completely clear space, like based on the wall behind me, you can see that I'm a Detroit sports fan. I went to Michigan state. I have a lacrosse helmet up there. I was in a conversation with the treasurer last week where all of a sudden that changed the tone of the conversation because he played lacrosse in high school. So we got into a 20 minute conversation around that. Now you're starting to see why my conversations usually go beyond 30 minutes. It's just the, you know, it's, it can work against you. You just want to be mindful of it and make sure that you're presenting the right image. Um, and then maintain a professional appearance if you're working from home regularly you may not necessarily have meetings regularly or video meetings regularly which it could be very easy to all of a sudden say oh yeah that's a completely space out and all of a sudden you're wearing a ripped t-shirt or a tank top or something to an interview and the person on the other side is saying what is going on here that's uh, again it kind of ties into the professional image the executive presence um, and just going back to hit you with some additional stats, just from what I've seen on actually Wonderlick, which is the uh, test that's used in the NFL during the combine, and then also career builder, according to Wonderlick, 93% of employers consider soft skills an essential or very important factor in their hiring decisions. And 62% of employers are specifically evaluating your soft skills in an interview. You know, the fact that you have the technical skills have pretty much gotten you to that point. Now this is your opportunity on top of the professional, because um, the soft skills tie into your professional appearance and you have to be careful with that uh, in the language that you use too. Um, I especially have to catch myself. I swear casually, it's, it's a challenge and I have to make sure, like sometimes it slips and I, I immediately am mortified, but that's the danger that you run if you are in a more relaxed atmosphere. You'll notice today, that's why I'm in a button down for the first time in three months, because I want to make sure that I'm actually putting on a professional appearance and uh, that I'm presenting to a professional group. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm putting out the right image there. Make sure that you're doing that with your interviews on both sides as well. So um, it also helps you keep the, the right frame of mind. You know, it's, uh, I don't know about you, if I'm working in shorts and a t-shirt, I tend to have a little bit more. It, it doesn't feel like work as much as if I put pants on and a dress shirt or something nice on. Um, it kind of, even while working from home, it gives you that feel that, hey, you know, this is a different mode than me just sitting around watching TV. And then last but not least, establish a rapport. Um, it's, that's, that's the similarity with the in-person. And this is how I always encourage people whether it's in-person, virtual, whatever it is, don't just jump right into grilling someone. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't go well. I, I ran into a hiring manager um, <laughs> a couple weeks back where I'm talking to the candidate or the job seeker after the interview and the very first question out of this person's mouth was, well, normally I wouldn't be interviewing you because you don't have a degree, uh, but you know, why, why should we be talking? And it's just like, why? why like what that doesn't all it's going to do is put that other person on the defensive and there is absolutely no chance this person could be the best person for that job in the world 
if you start off a conversation like that, it's just not going to go well. It's not going to leave that person with a good impression. So that, you know, even though it is over, it's not face to face, you're not going to have the handshake or anything to start it off. Start off with the, hey, how's your day going? Crazy times we're in, right? Like talk about the weather. It's uh, just anything. Ask how that person's day is going and actually mean it. And you'll be surprised by how that changes the tone of the conversation. Because the way that you start that conversation and that initial greeting and starting that rapport actually sets the tone for the rest of the conversation. So um, that's pretty much it from the bullet point standpoint. You know, just a couple of additional tips for interviewees as you're interviewing for jobs. Be prepared with questions about the company and the position we talked about earlier. It's kind of awkward if someone's just staring at you blankly and they don't have any questions. Um, my fail safe and what I always always advise people is if you can't think of anything else ask for the job and you should be doing that anyway and then now that i think about it but um you know it's ask questions such as hey what are the next steps in the process um if that's already covered throughout the course of the conversation then just say are there any concerns you have about moving me forward in your process if so what are they and it puts the other person on the spot a little bit but at the same time it shows that you're interested in the position and it gives you the opportunity to kind of expand on any confusion or I'm sorry, clear up any confusion or expand on any experience that may not have been um, messaged properly as you were answering their questions earlier early on. The last thing you want to do is leave that person after spending 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes with you uh, with questions about your experience. You want them to know that you're the right person for the job. And this is kind of your touch point to just say, Hey, this is me. Is there, is there anything that I didn't communicate properly? It's, it's opening yourself up a little bit. You just have to be prepared for that feedback. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add to this. And th these are all great points and, uh, uh, about questions. I think it's, it's a very important part of the interview process. And, uh, some, sometimes people um, shy away from, from asking. They do have those questions. For some reason, they don't feel it's appropriate to ask them all. Well, don't ask them all, ask the most important ones and try to, to figure out what, what is the, the pain in the organization. And I've heard this advice before from other people and I also support it. Uh, just try to figure out uh, what exactly, well, like what is the biggest struggle? Because if, if a hiring manager um, decide like it, it's a long way to um, establish a new role in an organization. I've done this in the past <laughs> myself, so uh, it, it, it's it's it, it, there. Sh there has to be a pain <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. If if there is no pain, there is no hiring process. But if they decided they need this position to be filled, or well, what if someone may have left? Um, but again, if 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 a great person left, they would like to have um, you know there, there's there are big shoes to fill. So uh, just try to figure out the, the, the story behind this role and it will help you to bring forward your best skills and, and qualities that will resonate with them. Yeah, absolutely. I, you bring up an excellent point. There is normally that'll be covered in the course of conversation, but also sometimes hiring managers don't think to bring that up as well. So make sure that you understand what you're getting into because you might be dodging a bullet if, uh, if you don't hear the backstory that you you like i think that's it's it's a mindset that i've seen improve but i think it's always been a little bit subservient where the job seekers are like oh i need to do whatever i can to get this job and i don't care what it is wow. uh, yeah, that does not work <laughs> well in, in the wonder, long run it never works <laughs> yeah you'll find yourself back in that job search three or six months later and that's the last thing that anyone wants both from from either side whether it's the hiring manager or the job seeker right Great. Cool. We have any other questions or anything? Um, so, would you like? Uh, we can we can open the floor for questions. I can cool. try to um, unmute the participants, and like you, you all can just unmute yourself if you would like to um, to ask a question. Let me just give me one second uh, here. I think the participants should be able to unmute themselves. So just just go ahead and do so, and and um, pop in with a question or type in in the Q&A box. That's also fine. I will read this out loud for Joe. Um, we, we have five more minutes to go. And I just wanted to bring this up. This session uh, qualifies for the CTP credits. Uh, it, it's going to be one of those three credits allowed for career-oriented uh, sessions for the CTP. But if you 
um, still have this um, the, the three credits um, if, if you if you did not fill them throughout your um, birth certification period. You, that's a great opportunity to do so. That's going to be qualifying for up to 1.2 credits for this session. Um, and I will send out the uh, letters after we uh, wrap up later today. Um, so, but anyways, while I'm talking, you just, uh, again, welcome to, to ask questions. I just wanted to um, bring up something here. We had a webinar, a career-oriented webinar last year in January, actually, so um, about 18 months ago. And uh, we were discussing mostly the possibility and probability of automation in Treasury and how all that affects um, the future hiring process, the skill set that treasurers need to obtain and all that. So um, I, I'm just interested in your pers perspective on this now with everything that's happening. Um, and it, of course, um, the, the, um, the maybe open roles dropped um, right now. This, I'm sure not gonna be like this forever. So <laughs> there's gonna be a recovery process. But um, aside from the pandemic and what's happening right now, um, do you feel this trend of uh, uh, more technical skills being uh, brought forward by, by the job descriptions and hiring managers? Yeah, yeah, you know, there's certainly, um, we see it more in the Bay Area than anywhere else. Uh, it's just, you know, the technology companies, number one, you have to have the money to invest in the technology. And then part two to that is you have to have the, the skill set to be able to, or the desire to want to learn about the technology. So yeah, anytime you can get involved in auto automation, RPA, anything like that, um, take the class. I mean, there are plenty of online certification courses. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of um, always investing in yourself and, and diversifying your skill set. The worst thing you learn from that is just what's going on and you learn that it's not gonna replace, like robots aren't gonna replace humans in the workplace. Um, in some cases, maybe, but I mean, I've been hearing the same thing in recruiting for at least the last five years where it's, oh, the, we can be replaced by chatbots and everything else. Well, yeah, but guess what? At the end of the day, much like treasury, recruiting is still a relationship business. And the people who focus on those relationships and, and that can actually bring the strategic value, that's what your AI and your robots aren't going to be able to bring. Um, so that's, if anything, it'll knock out the administrative tasks that you're uh, that you're tasked with each and every day and allows you to kind of pop your head up and be a little bit more strategic and be a greater value to the business. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we have a question. Um, oh, that's just uh, uh, a remark that this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy, for joining. Um, I enjoyed this session a lot too. And thanks, Joe, for, for being here with us today and presenting. It was really insightful. Um, and uh, I, I would like to mention that uh, Treasury Talent runs a, a professional group in, at Facebook, on Facebook. So um, I joined, I, I enjoy being there. I think the content is uh, gonna be great. So if you, you, if you wanna say a couple of words about this, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. So we have the Treasury Talent community on Facebook. Um, we're approaching 800 members quickly, which is pretty impressive because we've only been around for a little over a month now. Um, we have people from around the globe and uh, what it does is it provides another avenue. You kind of meet people where they're at, right? Like um, some people are more comfortable on Facebook. Some people are more comfortable on LinkedIn. Some aren't comfortable, some from LinkedIn aren't comfortable on Facebook because they don't want to overlap the two. Uh, but it's another avenue for us. We have weekly chats on Wednesdays where we discuss topics that Simon, Scotty and I, these are the discussions that we have in the market each and every other day. So. It's uh, just common questions that we get. If we can identify themes and trends, we make sure that we make those conversations topical. Um, and if you're not able to make it or you have reservations around the uh, joining the Facebook group, we also have a YouTube channel where it's a, we basically house all of the videos that we make, all the content that's related to treasury recruiting and hiring um, in your job search. So. Uh, it, you know, we're happy to connect with you on any avenue that you're comfortable with. We're trying to give you as many options as possible, and we're always open to having a conversation. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah, thanks, Joe, uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Stay tuned for the next webinars. Thank you. Thank you.